Hi everyone, it's Jeff Challen again. And uh, in the third installment of the screencasts for assignment zero, what I want to do is just look a little bit at the, the source tree. I'm not going to go uh, into detail here because that's really best for you guys to do on your own, but I want to give you a sense of how to get started um, and a sense of sort of uh, how to approach some of the questions that are in there for you to look at. So at this point, we've got uh, an development environment set up, and in the last episode, we were able to um, clone and build and install a kernel. So we're in good shape. But unfortunately, doing these assignments requires that you actually understand, not just be able to compile the source code that we gave you. Uh, there's 40,000 non-commenting lines of code um, in the OS 161 sources, and by assignment three, you'll have added several thousand more to that set. Um, I also want to point out, though, that as a pedagogical code base, OS 161 is extremely well commented. So there's 25,000 comments, um, which is pretty impressive. Uh, that's you know, sort of a ratio of one comment for every two lines. So reading this this code will help you, uh, and there's a plenty of commentary there that will that will try to help you uh, still. So the trick when you approach a code base like this is to divide it into three categories. There's code that we've given you that you do not need to understand at all. Um, and if you find yourself reading that code in the in the process of trying to debug something, you're, you're probably gone down a, a you know a, a bad path. There is code that you need to have intimate knowledge of that you really need to understand very, very well. And then there's code that's kind of in a gray area where you need to know something about it. You don't need to know it deeply, but uh, you need to know it's there and sort of what it does and how to understand it if, if things go wrong. Okay. So, and putting things into that category is, is sort of the, the critical task here. So let's get uh, back into our uh, virtual box here. So I'm going to um, see if this guy's still running. Looks like it is. Okay, great. So Here's the source directory that we cloned before. One thing I want to point out here is that the path, um, or sorry, the prompt here, uh, that's the default prompt in your Vagrant virtual machine, has some nice features to it. Uh, you may want to change it, but what's showing me right now here is the branch that I'm on. Um, so, um, so there's only one branch in this repository. Um, if you had more than one branch, it would, it would show you which one you were on. Uh, you may or may want, want to change this by uh, modifying your bash RC. Um, Okay, so let's look sort of what's in the top directory here, right? I have a build directory um, that um, is used during, while you build the user tools. Um, there's nothing really that, that's particularly interesting in there. Um, most of the directories here are really concerned with building user land tools. So you have man pages in here. Um, this can be something that you might want to uh, share. So the fact that this is shared here in my with my host is pretty useful because I can actually open this up and check it out. So here's my reference manual for OS 161, um, and this will tell you sort of a lot about the base system, right? So here's some information about the Hall command, for example. Okay, um, so that's there, um, pretty useful. But most of the stuff here is, is user code. So you have the binaries in, um, uh, sorry, let me go back up here. So I've got user land. This is where all the user binary code is. So uh, you know the user user program. So here's you know we talked about true in class, um, and here's been true, and just as promised, all been does is exit with success. Whereas if I go over here to been false, um, all it does is exit with failure. So okay. So here's our our user code. Um, like I said, I'm going to make this quick. Uh, so let's get to the good stuff. Let's get into the kernel directory. So this is where the interesting things are. Um, and uh, and it's important to kind of understand how things are organized. So in the arc directory, you have architecture-specific code. So there are two subcomponents to the architecture here. There's, there's the stuff that's specific to the MIPS um, instruction set and sort of system architecture that... Um, your OS 161 source is designed for. And then there's actually a code that's specific to the System 161 simulator. So David has put things into these two subdirectories. And there's code in here that you, you may or may not want to look at. Um, there's things in here that you will definitely need to understand. Um, and there's you know other code that, that you probably won't need to understand. So let's look in here. This is kind of interesting. Um, uh, as, I, as the assignment points out, your source is our, the sources for OS 161 are a mixture of C, um, which includes both .c and, and .h header files, and then assembly code. So here's a piece of assembly code. Uh, this is start.s, and this is actually what 
this is the kernel entry point. So this is the first code that's started by the bootloader, the system 161 bootloader when your kernel boots up. Um, so that's pretty neat. You'll notice here, as I promised, that the OS 161 sources are extremely well commented. Um, and uh, the assembly code, while it may be a little bit scary, is even better commented than most of it. So you can see that there's this long comment here. And if, and if you read some of this, actually, you can get some idea of what the assembly language instructions here are doing. In general, though, you don't you really need to understand the assembly code that you've been given for this class. All right, so let's go and let's look at them. So obviously, you know that the boot stuff is very specific to the System 161 simulator and how it boots. But let's look in our arc MIPS directory. Now, here's some interesting things. Here's ram.c. Uh, this is actually called during boot to set up um, to determine how much physical memory is available. Look at that. Here's a comment that told me exactly what to say, so that was nice. Um, so anyway, th this this has some functions in it that are used during assignment three, uh, but really what we're here to do is just go to sort of look around and get a sense for, for the layout. Um, okay, we will come back into ArcMIPS, uh, but let's go back to the base kernel directory. So you've already used the compile and configuration directories when you built your kernel. You have some idea of what's in there. Um, dev. So let's go into dev and look around. Um, this stuff you probably will not need to change. This is code for essentially kind of device drivers for some of the pseudo devices that are provided for the System 161 simulator. Um, in the file system directory, we have file system related code. Because we don't do the file system assignment right now, um, uh, for the appsclass.org assignments, uh, this is not stuff that you will need to look at. All right, um, GDB scripts, I actually have no idea what's in there, so I'm gonna leave that alone. Okay, the include directory. So this um, directory has includes that are uh, used by the kernel. And then there's this current subdirectory. So it turns out in order to interact with user programs, there's certain information that the kernel needs to export to user space. There are header files that are shared between the kernel and user programs, and this is where those live. So for example, uh, in order for the system call interface to work, and this is something we'll talk about more um, in, in class, this, uh, the, there needs to be an agreement between the kernel and between user programs about what the system call numbers are. So this file, which is shared with user space, defines the system call number. So if I pass zero to syscall, what I want to do is a fork. Right? Okay, so let's go. Uh, let's go back to Kern and keep looking around here. Okay, so now I've got a live directory. This has some sort of like common routines that the kernel uses, um, things like kprintf, for example. So here's a definition of kprintf, which is the main uh, printf function that's used by the kernel. Um, and actually one thing you'll notice here uh, is that kprintf um, will try to acquire a lock in order to protect its output, and this is something that doesn't work early in boot, that's why you see all that intermingled output uh, when you boot up a kernel without locks. Okay, so onward, um, we've looked a little bit in lib. Main has some interesting things in that, that you probably want to look at, including the code that uh, pro runs the menu, and main.c. So main.c is kind of the main entry point for the kernel. You can think of it as main for a typical program, and actually, um, it's not. Uh, main, but there is something called kmain, right? What does kmain do? It calls boot, runs the menu, which basically loops accepting arguments, and then uh, shuts down. So this should not execute because the menu should quit after you hit Q. All right. Um, what is in proc? Let's put, oh, I don't know why. I thought there was a proc directory. Oh, sorry. So here we are. Let's go into proc. And um, this is just very, very uh, limited process support that's been introduced in um, for uh, the new version of OS 161. And this is something you'll come back to in assignment two. Okay. Um, so sync probs has code that you're going to use in assignment one there. And this is something that we'll go over more when we talk about that assignment. Um, the VM directory, there's not much in here yet. Um, it does have the kmalloc code for the kernel allocator. Um, the VFS uh, is the virtual file system implementation, so that has sort of common, uh, defines the common abstraction that are used by the file system specific implementations. Um, one directory you might want to look at is test. So the test kernel directory has a bunch of different things in it, and these are tests that we're going to be using to test your kernel and to make sure that things work. So for example, the sync test file 
has a bunch of tests. These define the tests that are run as SY1, SY2, SY3, and SY4 uh, from the kernel menu. Um, and you are encouraged to understand this code. This gives you some starting points for some of the things you want to do in assignment one. Um, and But you are, one important caveat is that when we test your kernel, you are not allowed to modify anything in this directory. So you can modify it when you do things if you want to you know, uh, add some tests or see how additional things work. But when we test your kernel, we will overwrite the contents of the test subdirectory. That's in order to make sure that when we test your kernel, you're actually running the tests that we want you to run and not something uh, that just always succeeds. Okay, so in the thread directory, this has um, some basic routines related to threads on OS161. This is uh, thread.c in particular is a, is a good thing to look through uh, and to understand how some of this works. Okay, um, and that's pretty much it. So that's kind of an introduction. We didn't look in syscall, uh, we can. Um, this has some uh, this is a sort of a starting point of a directory where you will put files that will implement the system calls that you'll build as part of assignment two. All right, so let's go back to the assignment here. Now that we've done our, our, our extremely rapid overview, um, a lot of this is sort of documented right here in the assignment text. Uh, but I want to just look at one of these and talk a little bit about how you would answer uh, questions like this in the context of a system like OS161. So I know a lot about this system, so it's difficult for me to reproduce the feeling of, of being you and, and starting from scratch. But let me just sort of talk about what I would do, right? So let's talk about, um, let's talk about question number seven, right? So what is a zombie thread? That's a pretty high level question. And what I've given you is a bunch of C code. So how are you going to, to, to address this? Um, well, here's what I would do. I would go into the kernel directory because that's kind of, you know, where I figured out where the interesting stuff is. And I would do this, I would grep for Make that graph insensitive, zombie. Um, and check that out, right? So what, what have I found here? I've got um, some stuff in GDB scripts, which is safe to, uh, to ignore. Um, and then look at this. I've got some things in thread.c. Okay, so that's interesting. And it turns out that there's a comment right here uh, that seems useful. So let's take a look at thread.c, okay. So, same thing here, I'm gonna look around for zombie. Um, and, and here is exactly what a zombie thread is, right? So clean up zombies, zombies are threads that have exited but still need to have thread destroy called on them. So that is the OS161 definition of zombie. And I've answered this question, right? Now, I cheated a little bit here, right? Because this question is probably the one that has the best keyword embedded in it. But a lot of the questions that we're asking are things that, you know, with a little bit of grepping around, you'll be able to figure out. Um, and so that's that's my suggestion for how to do that. Um, things like C tags, um, I think it's called exuberant C tags, are also uh, potentially extremely useful. You can certainly install those in your virtual machine and use those as part of your Vim development environment or whatever you use. And this is a nice uh, way to navigate a code base like OS161 if you choose to use Vim, which is certainly supported. All right, so that's all for this. Uh, the next uh, screencast uh, will look a little bit at how to use Git.